forward to the talk. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I'm Tino Kolnick. I'm a principal investigator here at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our next and final speaker of uh, today's session. Marion Pertz is Associate Professor of Innovation Management at the Department of Strategy and Innovation at Copenhagen Business School. And Marion is also Scientific Director of the Ludwig Boltzmann Gesellschaft Open Innovation in Science Center. Inspired by phenomena linked to open innovation and open science, Marion's research focuses on strategy, management, and organization of open and collaborative knowledge production. And Marion currently leads two large scale research projects around these topics in Denmark and in Austria. I'm delighted to introduce Marion's talk entitled Open Innovation in Science Role and Value in the Health Sciences. Over to you, Marion. Thank you very much, Tina, for the nice introduction. And thank you for having me at your conference. I'm not much of an expert in digital health and prevention. So it's an even greater pleasure to be able to talk about the role and value of applying open and collaborative practices in health research at your conference. So thanks for inviting me. I'll switch to presentation mode. Uh, if anyone could give me a sign if that works out, is that fine? Yes? It looks perfect, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. So before going into like some more conceptual stuff, I'd like to start out with an example. Uh, and what you can see here on this slide is a picture of the Open Innovation Science Award ceremony that was held a couple of weeks ago at the Einstein Center for Neurosciences at Charité Berlin. The um, Einstein Center Open Innovation Science Award awards neuroscientific research projects that convincingly apply or convincingly demonstrate how they apply openness and collaboration in their scientific research in order to increase the productivity and impact of their scientific research. And on this picture, you see the winners and the finalists of the award. And these two young researchers here, they are a part of a research team uh, at the Prevention and Therapy Center at Charité Berlin, and they work on digital psychiatry. And I thought I'd bring this example because it could be particularly interesting to this group because their, open, their project, their research is about developing a digital health application for people with bipolar disorder. And as many of you may know, bipolar disorder is a severe mental illness and so far, we don't have a lot of digital health applications that could close the gap between the need for uh, therapy and the availability of therapeutic tools. And, and since this is a very complex mental illness, bipolar disorder, the researchers around this team, uh, they have convincingly demonstrated that by, in order to get valid data on unmet needs and digital preferences of patients with bipolar disorder, they need to co-develop the data collection instrument together with patients and peer specialists. They also showed us that co-analyzing the data that is collected as part of their research project can reduce biases in interpreting the data. And then they also use the outcome of this data analysis to collaboratively together with the patients, with the peer specialists and with companies develop a digital therapy tool for addressing bipolar disorder. So a very recent example uh, that convinced the jury and made the team around this project one of the award winners a couple of weeks ago in Berlin. But now back to some elements that I'd like to address in my talk today. As I mentioned, I'm not an expert in digital health and prevention, but we've been doing a lot of work in better understanding the role and value of openness of collaboration in scientific research. And we have also looked into a lot of examples in the health sciences. So when talking about the role and value of open innovation in science, I'd like to point out that it's very important that we have a contingent view on openness and collaboration. That means that applying open and collaborative practices to science is not an on-top activity. It is something that is meant as a means to increase the productivity and impact of scientific research, and it is not an end in itself. And related to this, it's also important that different disciplines in scientific research within and across the health sciences 
um, benefit more or less from different types of openness and collaboration. So there is no one size fits all. And I'm getting into that in a minute to give you also a couple of examples here. The second aspect I'd like to focus in my talk is that while many of you might be familiar with more traditional ways of incorporating open science, such as open access publications, preprints, um, pre-registration of studies and so on, as part of the open innovation science concept, we talk about not only unidirectional knowledge flows from science to society, but we also talk about inbound, outbound, and coupled knowledge flows and inter- and transdisciplinary collaborations so that scientists engage with the world outside the academic institution, whether that is different scientific disciplines, whether that is companies, patients, uh, the, the general public or other kinds of stakeholder groups in um, uh, jointly improving the productivity and impact of scientific research. And not only at the end of a scientific research process, but along the entire process from conceptualizing a new research project to eventually translating it into innovation. Let's start out with my first key message here, that openness and collaboration, particularly in the health sciences, are seen as means to increase the productivity and impact of scientific research, not an end in itself. And here, of course, it's important, particularly in the health sciences, that we also uh, consider aspects of openness for the purpose of empowering patients, educating the general public, raising awareness, advocacy, fighting an increased skepticism against science and yeah, addressing uh, as we have experienced it all over the past years, uh, an increased amount of fake news. But the focus here in, 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 in the understanding of open innovation science is clearly on scientific output and impact. How can we use openness and collaboration to improve productivity and impact of scientific research? And this all builds on a debate that many of you have might have uh, followed over the past decades um, and where openness and collaboration are seen as potential means to address challenges of the established ways of doing science. So we're facing scientific a decline in scientific productivity. We see an increasing incrementalism in science, so smaller and smaller contributions. We have research out there showing that there clearly is a novelty bias. The more novel our research is, the less likely it gets funding. You all, I'm sure, particularly in the health uh, sciences, you are aware of the publication bias, that it's very difficult to publish negative data. We have issues of not rep replicating, not being able to replicate many of the studies. We have lots of scientific research fields, including the medical sciences, showing that most of the research has low or no impact. Many papers not even have a single citation. At, uh, not even speaking about the translational gap, knowing that much of the research, even if it's excellent research, is never translated into innovation. We know that university patents, so particularly patents coming out of publicly funded research, are much less likely to be used and translated into innovation than company patents. There's all kinds of limits to the peer review system, and I'm sure you're aware of that, the publisher parish story and so on. So there's all kinds of challenges in scientific research. And that probably as a reaction to these challenges, we see increasing demands to uh, increase the scientific and the societal impact of scientific research, particularly with respect to the grand challenges of our times, including, for example, fighting um, the global pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, climate, uh, uh, global warming, and so on. And we also see increasing policy attention to open science and open innovation, including new funding schemes and requirements. I don't know how many of you have engaged in trying to obtain funding from the European Union recently, but if you have done so, you may have realized that the New Horizon funding scheme, for example, has mandatory and recommended open science practices, and these are considered in the evaluation of your proposals. These requirements include very standard approaches of open access publishing or applying fair principles to data management, but it, they also include, for example, aspects of citizen science involving all kinds of stakeholder groups in the co-creation of research and innovation agendas and in the co-creation of research projects. A very interesting example that might that some of you may actually have been applied uh, for is, uh, is a call uh, that has been issued this spring or last spring um, for new methods and technologies for cancer screening and early detection. And interestingly, in this call for research funding, the call explicitly requires 
uh, proposals to consider the use of living labs or other methods for co-creating research with the relevant stakeholder groups. So openness and collaboration are more and more also a required aspect uh, if you want to receive research funding. And let me show this to you as part of an example to make it more tangible. Uh, and this is an example, not from the health sciences, but from the material sciences, but I'm getting there. This is a really interesting open science platform that has been established a couple of years ago at Aarhus University. And uh, they have a large material science department. And the idea was, well, the initial focus of this project, we openly share all our data and insights. And by doing so, anyone can use and reuse our data for research and development in companies. So that was the idea. Unfortunately, nothing happened just by openly sharing the outcome. So they learned that they have to actively engage in collaborations, in facilitating collaborations. So they changed their platform and they invited industry and other society stakeholders to come in and to jointly develop basic research projects, and then share it and later think about what kind of research is interested, interesting to be IP protected? What kind of research do we want to um, translate into innovation? And inspired by these initial experiences from this platform, they now established a number of new platforms. And now they're not anymore talking about open science platforms, but open innovation science platforms. This is a platform that has been launched around two years ago for biomarkers and target validation, and it follows the same logic. So basically, all kinds of societal stakeholders, particularly uh, large industrial companies, but also small companies, scientists from different um, departments and different universities are invited to co-create basic research proposals. So we're talking about TRL levels one to three here. Um, and then the Novo Nordisk Foundation, a large Danish funding organization, is willing to fund the best co-created proposals. And those teams who receive the funding can then collaboratively implement their research. There's two conditions here. First of all, they have to, all the research that they produce has to be openly shared. And second, they actually have to do the research in a collaborative or co-creative fashion. And the rationale behind this is to speed up uh, on the one hand side, high risk high gain research, but also to speed up the translation of basic research into more applied research. And building on the success of the second platform, just two weeks ago, they've launched a third platform where the Novo Nordisk Foundation invests more than 300 million crowns, that's about 30 million euros, into basic research in plant-based food science with the same rationale. Um, all kinds of stakeholders from society, particularly, of course, also companies and academia co-create basic research proposals. The best ones uh, get the funding. Um, they commit to openly sharing all their outcomes. And the goal of this is to facilitate, as I mentioned, high-risk, high-gain research, but also in increase the likelihood of translation. So moving on to my second aspect with respect to this contingent view of openness and collaboration science. No one, there is no one size fits all. And this is just a random selection here. Uh, and I hope you can find yourself somewhere in here, but we have seen that different disciplines, different scientific disciplines call for different approaches of openness and collaboration science. While for example, in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic and research around it, lots of open data repositories, lots of preprints and other open approaches have been very important. We see other ways of openness and collaboration in other disciplines. For example, in many basic research fields, gamified crowd science projects have made important contributions. In other fields, such as med in the medical sciences, climate research, we see more stakeholder involvement, co-production of research, new forms of indus industry academia co-creation, new forms of co-creation with patients. And of course, we also see for large scale projects such as the human brain project, large big science infrastructures as means to helping us in um, improving the productivity and impact of this research. The Epidemium project could be particularly interesting for you. It's, it's, it's a platform where um, basically uh, scientists from different disciplines, companies and other stakeholders can engage in cancer research through big data anal um, analytics an interesting platform, so you can get the slides and of course you can explore these examples yourself. 
Another important message is that different types of research require different open innovation science approaches. While all of us may kind of like cycle through different periods of doing basic research and applied research throughout our careers, we know that doing basic research has different uh, uh, conditions as compared to doing applied research. In basic research, for example, and this is from the neurosciences, um, gamified crowd science has had big successes. This is the project iWire, one of the first crowd science projects where millions of people all around the world help um, uh, neuro, help the, the reconstruction of neurons by means of uh, playing 3D puzzle games and artificial intelligence. We also have discussed an example of use inspired basic research as part of the Odin model. Uh, the model that has been funded by the Novo Nordisk Foundation, where based companies and other stakeholders together with scientists co-create basic research. Looking into pure applied research, one example that might be close to your field of interest is RADA CNS. RADA CNS is, is a project that basically used collaborative approaches to involving universities, companies, and patient organizations to investigate the use of wearable, wearable devices and smartphones to help measure and predict clinical out, outcomes uh, in depression, multiple sclerosis or epilepsy. And then of course, to develop respective tools accordingly. And since I was also invited to speak about the value uh, of openness and collaboration science, here's some statistics from last year's um, IMI, Innovative Medicines Initiative funding from the European Union comparing the performance of IMI funded projects where the researchers engage in these open and collaborative uh, uh, setups with uh, traditionally produced scientific research in similar fields. And it's, for example, very interesting to see that the field normalized citation impact of IMI funded project papers was almost twice the world average uh, between two, 2010 and 2020. So the point that I want to make here is openness and collaboration should never be something you do on top of your research. It should be something that is integrated in your research at the, and that can help you to improve the productivity and impact of your research. Let's move on to the second part of my talk. Um, as I mentioned, many of you may be familiar with open access publishing or, or open data sharing or science communication. But openness and collaboration in science is much more. It's also about learning from the outside world and also along the entire scientific research process. And for doing so, we have developed the Open Innovation Science Framework, which acts as a unifying foundation for understanding processes, effects, and boundary conditions of openness and inter-respectively transdisciplinary collaborations along the entire scientific research process, from generating new scientific insight to translating it into innovation. The framework itself has been collaboratively developed in an OIS approach among 50 researchers from all kinds of disciplines. And as I mentioned before, it focuses on the productivity view. So thinking about how along the research process can we use openness and collaboration as a means to improve productivity and impact of our research. Let me show you some examples here uh, to make it more tangible. This is a project that some of you may know. It has been done uh, by the Ludwig Boltzmann uh, Institute for Experimental and Clinical Traumatology. Um, in this project, um, crowds of patients uh, and medical professionals, nurses, nurses and doctors were invited to submit research questions. So they were invited to tell the researchers what kind of research questions should be studied in the field of traumatology. And many hundred research questions were submitted in 2018. And uh, as a result of looking into all these questions and clustering them, uh, a new transdisciplinary research group at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Experimental and Clinical Traumatology was founded in 2019. As part of my research, and again, addressing the question of how valuable is it to engage in open and collaborative research in the health sciences, as part of my research together with uh, my co-authors, we have looked into the quality of re these research questions. So we, we took data from this project and other projects where crowds were, research questions were crowdsourced and investigated what is the nature and quality of these research questions generated by crowds of patients, caretakers, and medical professionals. And in this paper, we found that the majority, of course, of the crowd questions 
were not really helpful for research. Yeah? They were basically problem restatements. But if crowd members submitted a research question, these research questions were much more often interdisciplinary, combining dependent and independent variables from across different fields. When comparing the crowd-generated questions to questions generated by professional scientists in this field, we found that the majority, um, the average crowd-generated questions had lower novelty and no lower scientific impact and a similar practical impact. But the interesting finding of that study, and that is also something that I hope inspires you to think about this in your research, the very best crowd-generated questions, so those that the top questions from across the crowd, they outperformed the questions generated by professional scientists on all dimensions. So on novelty, on scientific impact, and on practical impact. So it may pay off to also think about applying open and collaborative approaches to early stages in your scientific research. Another project that I found very interesting and that is within your field, within digital health and prevention is a citizen science project that investigates whether bedtime technology um, has an effect on the body's circadian rhythm. So whether children who play uh, or engage with digital tools in the evening, whether that has a an effect on their sleep behavior and respectively, of course, also on the way they can um, perform in their daily life and in school. And in this project, what was interesting here is anyone basically in the world is invited to become a co-researcher, can download digital and physical uh, questionnaires and can basically study your children's uh, uh, bedtime technology use and the effects it has on, on basically the inner clock of your children. So an interesting project. A final project that I wanted to show you that also nicely highlights the value of engaging in openness and collaboration science is uh, Folded. Folded is a crowd, a gamified crowd science initiative for protein folding. Those of you who are in this field may know that protein folding is a complex activity. So by engaging millions of people from around the world to play protein folding games, to unfold or to fold and unfold proteins, um, this crowd science approach not only generated very important data for studying uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, or other diseases such as HIV. It has also generated very important data for important scientific publications in the top journals, for example, in PNS or in, in Nature. And an interesting detail in this is that the folded crowd doesn't want to uh, decide that they don't want to be named individually on these publications. They are basically named as the folded players as one of the co-authors on their publication. So closing up here, um, and then I open for questions. Um, these were a lot of examples that show how uh, openness and collaboration can contribute in the health sciences. But in order to fully capture, to create value with doing this and capture value from it, it's important to build individual and organizational capabilities. To, so to think about what is it that I as a scientist need to learn in order to be able to productively use these new tools. How does my, our scientific environment, our research group, our lab, uh, our research institution, our university, our scientific community needs to be organized in order to support scientists in productively applying open and collaborative approaches to their health science. So thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to receive your questions. Thank you very much indeed, Mariam, for this lovely talk. And I'm sure it'll be as helpful to those in the audience who are perhaps not so familiar with the open innovation in science approach um, as to those who are already working along this, this approach. You had some really nice examples and uh, also conceptual insights there for us. Thank you very much. Um, we now have about five minutes.